There was a man who went and bought a donkey from a preacher. The preacher said to the man, you need to know something about this donkey. It's a little bit different than most donkeys that you've bought. It's been trained in a very specific way because he's a preacher's donkey. And so this donkey will only move when you say the word hallelujah. And the donkey will only stop when you say the word amen. The man thought, well, that's a little weird, but I think I can deal with that. So he bought the donkey, and he hopped on it, and he said, hallelujah. And sure enough, the donkey starts going. And he said, amen. And the donkey stopped. Thought, okay, well, this ain't bad. Hallelujah, he said. And the donkey starts going again. And, and off they go on their journey. And as they go, they, pretty soon the man notices that up ahead, there's a cliff that they're heading right towards on the path. And he thinks, okay, well, what was that word I was supposed to say to get him to stop? And he couldn't remember. And so he just starts saying stuff, stop donkey, and the donkey didn't stop. Halt donkey, and the donkey just starts going faster. And pretty soon he starts to panic because the cliff is getting closer. And he's thinking, okay, it's like, a, it's like a church word. Bible, Jesus, preacher, and the donkey doesn't stop. And he's about to go over the cliff, and so finally he just, he says, I'm just going to pray. Almighty God, please make this donkey stop, amen. And the donkey stops right before the cliff. And then he looked up in the heaven and he said, hallelujah. <laughs> there's, another, there's another donkey joke I want to share with you. This one actually comes from the Bible. It goes like this. There was once a king named Balak. And Balak ruled a land called Moab. Troubled times to come upon the land of Moab. See, there was this new nation that was just laying waste to all the other nations around Moab. And this new nation had set up camp right outside the borders of King Balak's land. Balak had heard about this new nation, the Israelites, and how they were defeating all these other kings. And, and he had heard that their God is very powerful and that their God fights for them. And so King Balak knew that he wasn't going to be able to defeat Israel with the sword. He had to get some other help, some, some spiritual help. Balak had heard about a, a mighty sorcerer who had great power in the spiritual realm. And he lived in the east. And so he sent a delegation of men to the east to go to this sorcerer. His name was Balaam. And they went to Balaam and they said, Balaam, would you please come with us and would you curse the Israelites so that we could defeat them? Now, Balaam was a clever guy. He's, he knows he's not going to look too desperate. And so he says, well, before I go with you, let me sleep on it. Let me pray about it, he says. And so you stay here, I'll go, I'll go sleep tonight, and, and I'll let you know in the morning. So he goes to bed that night, and God comes to Balaam in a dream, and God says to him, don't go with these men, don't go curse Israel. And so the next day, Balaam gets up, he says to Balak's men, sorry, I'm not coming with you, and he sends him home. The delegation goes back, and they say to King Balak, Balak, I'm sorry, Balaam won't come with us. Well, Balak, he's not going to take no for an answer, and so he sends an even bigger delegation with even more money back to Balaam. They say, oh, Balaam, would you please come with us and curse Israel? And if you do this, you'll be rewarded handsomely. Well, once again, Balaam, he's a clever guy. He knows not to look too desperate. And so he says, let me sleep on it. And he goes and he goes to sleep. And, and that night, once again, God comes to him. This time, God says, okay, Balaam, go with these men. Go with Balak's men. But do only what I tell you to do. Only say what I tell you to say. Now, at this point in the story, it doesn't say it explicitly, but, but scholars, I think, suggest that we should start reading between the lines a little bit here. That, that Balaam, he wakes up the next morning and he agrees to go with these men, as God had told him to do, but Balaam is greedy. He wants the money that they've brought for him. And so I, I don't think Balaam intends to do what God told him to do. I think he intends to go and curse Israel. And so he gets on his donkey and, and they start to ride back to Moab. And that's when Balaam's donkey starts acting kind of funny. First he veers off the road and goes off into a field. Balaam gets off the donkey and he starts beating the donkey. What's wrong with you, donkey? And he gets him back on the road. And off they go. Pretty soon they come to a place in the road where there's a wall on either side of the road. And the donkey starts freaking out again. This time he pushes up against the side of the wall and crushes Balaam's foot against the wall. Well, now Balaam's furious with his donkey. He gets off, he beats the donkey again and gets him back going on the road. And then they come to a place in the path where it's so narrow that you can't turn around. This time the donkey starts freaking out again and just sits down and won't budge. Well, now 
Balaam is embarrassed, humiliated, and furious. He gets off, he starts beating the donkey with his staff. And that's when it happens. The donkey starts talking to him. Here's what the donkey says. What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. That's not what I would say if a donkey started talking to me, but that's where he goes. <laughs> the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey that you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. I believe that if you were a young Jewish boy or girl living 2,500 years ago, sitting around the campfire with your people, and they were sharing the stories of their people, this would be one of the stories that they would share. And I believe that when you hear the story, you would think it's hilarious. You would be rolling on the ground laughing. How, how could this, this mighty sorcerer, this, this powerful prophet, how could he not see God when his donkey can? The point is that it's possible for a donkey to be more alert to God's presence than a prophet. It's possible to walk right past God and not know he was there. It's possible to be in the presence of God and be completely blind to it. We can have hearts that are so full of the things of this world that we miss God when he's looking right at us. Today we continue a sermon series called How to Love Your Bible. And we talked about reading the Bible scripturally. We say, read it like a script. You're an actor in God's drama, and the Bible's your script. We, we, last week, we talked about reading it politically. That was interesting. You should go back and listen to that. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about reading it spiritually. You need to read your Bible spiritually. Listen, here's the, here's the truth. We got a lot of different ways of saying it as Christians, but the fact is we have all agreed for centuries that somehow, Somehow, in a mysterious way, God mediates himself to us through this book. God speaks to us through this book. This book's different than other books. He mediates himself to us through the words of this book. In fact, the, the, the biblical writers seem to believe in something that we might call a, a dual authorship. That, yeah, the Bible's written by people, you know, and it's kind of edited and put together by people. But at the same time, God has been involved in the process. There's like a dual authorship going on here. Paul says that when he speaks, he says he's speaking in Christ. He says that he has been sent by God. And then, of course, you have the prophets who believe themselves to be like the mouthpieces of God. The fact is, if you want to accept the Bible the way the people who wrote the Bible intended it to be accepted, then you must accept the fact that God speaks through the Bible. To read the Bible spiritually means to read it as though God is reaching out to us through it. Listen, I, I suspect that in the end, we will look back on our enlightened modern age and realize we were a bunch of Balaams. You know, like God was there. And we just kept right on going. It's kind of a rough analogy, but in Harry Potter, there's a book Tom Riddle's diary, and that book talks back to you. That book's also the source of, like, evil, so the analogy breaks down a little bit. <laughs> but the Bible talks back to us, too. In fact, we don't, I don't necessarily like to call Jesus is the word of God. That's what John tells us. But God's message is contained in this Bible. And you know what the writer of Hebrews says about God's message? It says that it's alive and active. This message can penetrate us in a way that others cannot. It can, it can leap off the page. It can cross over centuries. And it can plop itself down right here in 2024. One day I was reading my Bible in my office. And, and this was early in the church planting days. Table Church has been around for about four and a half years now. And uh, this was early in our, in our life as a church, and I was just feeling all sorts of anxiety and kind of overwhelmed and fear about everything. 
and I read this verse, very famous verse that Paul had written to a young pastor. And it goes like this. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And in that moment, it was like God was speaking to me. It was like, it was like God was saying, listen, Phil, there's a lot of things you could be feeling right now in ministry. One thing you shouldn't feel is fear. He isn't, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear or timidity. I'm giving you one of power, of love, and of discipline. And if you chase those three things, you're going to be just fine. And, and now it's like, that's my prayer, God. Like, give me power and love and discipline in ministry. There was a, there was a season where um, I lost my, my temper probably a little too easily with my kids. And guess what verse God brought me to in that season? Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. <laughs> I mean, how much more obvious? You do this enough, and you're going to feel like you're in that Bruce Almighty scene where he's like, God, show me a sign. And then a truck pulls out in front of him with full of signs. And they're like, stop, caution, wrong way, you know. Like, you're going to feel like that. If, if you start to approach the scriptures believing that God wants to say something to you, that's how it's going to go. Sometimes when God speaks, it's... It's not about anything in particular. Sometimes it just compels you to worship. This happened to me recently. I read 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Listen to this verse. Just, oh, this is delicious. It says this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You can't understand that. Like, we can't master that verse. You could write a PhD thesis on that verse. You're no closer than when you began. That's amazing. Listen, when, when we have encounters with God in the scripture, you need to mark it in your Bible, okay? Like, some of us are kind of OCD about, we don't mark up our Bibles, you know what I mean? No, 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 no. Like, wear this thing out, write it down. Put a date. Like when you read a, a, a text and it just kind of speaks to your, where you're at right now, write down the circumstances to remind your future self of what was going on and how God worked in it. When I wrote this sermon, I just had to flip through my Bible in order to remember all the times that God has spoken to me through my Bible. It's, this is the easiest sermon I ever wrote. Wear out your Bibles. Listen, we need more people who are like Balaam's donkey than they are like Balaam. We need people who have eyes to see that God is here. So I want to give you a couple, a couple tips this morning on how not to be a Balaam, all right? Here's how not to be a Balaam. You got to be hungry for correction and be obedient with direction. You got to be hungry for correction and obedient with direction. I was pretty proud of that little sentence. <laughs> I was, you should write that down probably. It's good. Listen, this is where reading the Bible spiritually begins. Let's, let's start with the first half of the sentence. Be hungry for correction. Look, I've said it before. If you want God in your life, you have to want God in your life. You know what I'm saying? Like people sometimes say, yeah, I want, I want God in my life. I want, I want to know God's will. I want him to speak to me. But let's be honest. They're probably not going to change anything. They don't really want God in your life because if, when God comes into your life, he can't, he can't leave everything the same. If you want God in your life, you have to want God in your life. And listen, part of wanting God in your life means wanting his correction. And listen, being hungry for it. You know that it's okay to be hungry for God's correction? I mean, I, it doesn't, it's never fun to be correct, corrected by God, but in a way it can be. You know why I think it can be fun? to be corrected by God, because when God corrects you, when he speaks to you in that way, you know what that means? It means the God of the universe just spoke to you. That's cool. Like, that's a lot cooler than whatever little habit it is that you don't want to quit, you know? Like, that's a bigger deal than whatever thing that you, you know, you're holding on to that you need to surrender. The God of the universe just spoke to you. It means that when God corrects us, it means that he cares about us. It means that he's not trying to take your joy away. He's trying to infuse your life with an unimaginable amount of it. That's incredible. 
Be hungry for correction from God. It's a gift when God corrects us. It means that we're seen. It means that we're known. So hunger for it. When we open scripture, say, God, if there's any unrighteous way in me, would you tell me? God likes to answer those kinds of prayers, by the way. It happened to me recently. Um, many of you know we, we just launched an immigrant connection office here at Table Church. And so what that means is uh, my wife, Natalie, and Taryn Obink, they went through a whole training process and they are now, um, they are now able to provide legal services for immigrants and refugees at a, at a low, low cost. And so it's a tremendous resource for people in our community. And it's just been, it's, it's been blown up. They had a great week. I think you had six clients this week, Taryn, right? So they saw six clients this week. Um, and it's the word spreading. We haven't done anything to advertise. It's just, it's just spreading uh, because it's a big need in our community. And so praise the Lord for that. But um, what that means is that now Natalie has another eight hours a week that she's actually getting paid for. And so the Wiseman's got a little bump in our income. That's cool, right? And I'm, I'm working on a sermon one day, and I just feel like the Lord kind of tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me, hey, you, you're making more money, but you haven't increased your tithe. And I was like, oh, big deal, whatever, you know, we're close enough. And God's like, bro, you, <laughs> you're going to preach this stuff, and you're not going to do it? And I just felt this conviction this isn't the first time I've done that. But there's like a six-month delay, right? I get a little raise, and then I go change my tithe. And God's convicting me of this. Listen, I'm a church planter, okay? My wife's a children's ministry director at this church. She gets a little stipend for it. Now she's got this eight-hour-a-week part-time job. Like, we're well provided for. We're not rich. We're never going to be rich, you know what I mean? It's a lot of money going out the door every, every month. To tithe, like 10% of what we make but we believe that that's what Christians ought to do, and so we've always done it, and if I'm going to preach it, then i got to do it too. And so God's like, Phil, where are you at, man? And so I went and I adjusted our tithe. I felt the correction of God. I did. By the way, if I'm, if I'm sharing that and you feel the correction of God, whether it's in that department or another, <laughs> praise the Lord. That's awesome. He's speaking to you. So here's your next step in light of that. Don't just be hungry for correction, be obedient with direction. Jesus tells a story about a farmer who scatters seed. He puts some seed on the rocky soil. That doesn't grow very well. And then he puts some seed down and gets eaten by birds, puts some more seed and gets choked by thorny plants. And then he puts some seed on good soil. And that seed takes root and it grows and it bears fruit. The definition of good soil is someone who does something with the word but that's been given to them. Listen, it is not enough to have spiritual insights when we read the Bible. It's not enough to have spiritual insights. We must also bear spiritual fruit. Okay, I could come here today and I, you know, sometimes in a sermon, maybe I'll give you like, oh, here's the historical context of this passage, right? Or here's what that Greek word actually means. And so that kind of changes things a little bit. And it's like, whoa, cool, new insight on the text, right? And so now we get excited because now we understand this text in a way we never have before. And you know what we've accomplished at that point? Nothing. Zero. It's only when it takes root and bears fruit that something has happened. A seed lying in the dirt is nothing. It's not enough to have spiritual insights, like you got to do something with it too. This is where the rubber meets the road in our discipleship. When God taps you on the shoulder in that moment, what are you going to do? Do you lean into it or do you lean away from it? Do you stop up your ears or do you say, God, I'm listening? Listen, here's something true about the spiritual life. It's this, obedience leads to discernment. Obedience leads to discernment. What I mean by that is this, the more you do God's will, the more of God's will you will know. Jesus teaches this in another parable, the parable of the talents. Basically says, those who do much with what they're given will receive more. The more you do God's will, the more of God's will you will know. So be hungry for correction and be obedient with direction. We're going to practice together today reading the Bible 
spiritually. We're going to do like a, a group activity, if you will. I shouldn't have said that. That just turned everyone off, didn't you? I hated group activities in school. We're going to do a group activity. We all love each other, so it's fine. It's going to be a simple exercise. It's, uh, it's called Lectio Divina. It's an ancient method of reading scripture in order to kind of discern the heart and the voice of God in the text. And so it kind of helps clear our hearts and clear our minds in order to let God speak to us. And there's, there's four steps to Lectio Divina. You read and you reflect or meditate. You pray and then you contemplate. Now, contemplate, I think a lot of times we hear that word today and we think it basically means reflect or meditate. It's actually different. So a contemplative person is somebody who has learned to kind of see the fingerprints of God and the presence of God everywhere in the world. And so to contemplate the scripture means to kind of take it with us out into the world. And so contemplate is actually a verb. It, it's like, it's active, it's movement, it's living out the text that we read. So we're going to read, we're gonna reflect, we're gonna pray, and we're gonna contemplate this morning. That's Lectio Divina. So to do this, would you just turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 62? You can pull out a physical Bible or you can pull out a phone and Google Psalm 62. Um, or you can just look at the screen above me and it'll be up there as well. Psalm 62 verses 6 through 8 is what we're going to look at today. We're going to read it out loud together and then I'm going to kind of guide us through this practice. And we're just going to see where the Lord takes it. Psalm 62 Verses 6 through 8. Would you just read it out loud with me? Um, I'm reading in the NIV, so if you don't have the NIV, you can look on the screen and then we'll all be together. It says this. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. I'm just going to be silent for a moment as you can kind of pour over those words one more time if you'd like. So we've read it now. Let's reflect. Would you close your eyes? Let's do this meditation together. How does the metaphor, he is my rock, and he is my fortress, how does that hit you today? Do you need a rock? that place of safety and security? A fortress? A place of protection? A point of reference as the ocean swirls around you? I want to invite you to enter this metaphor for a moment. Imagine that you're surrounded by a raging sea. The waves are crashing. You can feel the water getting you wet. You can see the swirls of the ocean. It's raging all around you. Would you name your sea, your chaos today? What name would you give that chaos today? Is it job security, relationships, finances? What's the name of your raging sea today? Now imagine you're sitting in the middle of it on a rock and though you can feel the water, you can see the water, you know the water cannot harm you 
because you're safe. Now imagine, imagine that Jesus is sitting on the rock with you. <laughs> and you see him there and he's, he's completely calm. Kind of reminds me of a story in the Gospels where there's a, no, there's, a, there's a storm on the sea and the disciples are losing their minds and Jesus is taking a nap in the boat. And they're panicking. They say, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus basically says, you've forgotten who you're with. And so Jesus is calm. It's, it's, and you, can, you can see the lightning and hear the thunder. And you see the chaos all around you and yet you see the eyes of Jesus and you know that you're safe too. Somehow you know that it's going to be okay. Let his peace and strength be yours too. And now we move to the next step, which is prayer. Would you pray this text? Just in your heart, pray this with me as I say it out loud. God, I need a fortress today. Be my rock. This verse says that I should trust in you at all times. God, I honestly, I fail miserably at that. So forgive me. Anchor me, embolden me, God. Turn my heart back to you. And finally, we're going to contemplate. Remember what that is? That's to, to live it out, to bear fruit. So what needs to happen in your life? What boundary do you need to draw? What conversation do you need to have? What burden do you need to surrender? What forgiveness do you need to extend? What virtue do you need to cultivate in your heart right now in order to do the things that you know God is calling us to do? Remember, we want to be hungry for correction and be obedient with direction. So is God giving you direction right now? Do you know what needs to happen and you just either don't want to or don't know how? Reach out or else just say, God, okay, I surrender. I'm going to follow you. Have you been waffling back and forth on an issue of obedience? If that's the case, maybe God's not your rock and it's time for you to plant yourself, to anchor yourself on this rock who is safe, immovable, trustworthy, and true. So let us commit to doing that today. So this has been a short, brief example of what it means to practice Lectio Divina, and I hope that it was meaningful for you, but we have a bookmark. We're gonna hand one out right now. Just go ahead and hand those out, guys. Everyone gets bookmark. It's got the four steps on it. At the very bottom, a very small print, you'll notice there's actually some suggested passages that you can uh, practice Lectio Divina with. And so you can start there, and hopefully it'll be um, a good help to you as you kind of get started with reading the Bible spiritually. Let me pray for us one last time, and then we're going to sing again. Well, God, today we know that you've moved, that you've worked, that you've spoken, and so thank you. If it's a voice of correction, thank you. Now, Lord, as we leave here, may we be obedient with direction. We love you, God, in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we